Everything is peaked out in the spring. The whole of the world is turning on, and the bass turn on with it. The number one thing to look for, as silly as it sounds, is uh, signs in nature that things are happening. And, and one thing I have always realized is that when the dogwoods are blooming, and this is true everywhere because they bloom at the same time of the season, when the dogwoods are blooming, the bass are spawning. Uh, when the red buds bloom, which is a little bit before the dogwood, the males are on the nest. When the dogwoods are blooming, both the fish are on the nest, and, and you have the spawn going full gear. The, the temperature of the water, of course, is the key. Generally, the male starts this whole process out. He stakes out an area, and he constructs a nest, and he has it to himself for a week, perhaps two weeks, and that's when the temperature is somewhere around 58 to 60 uh, in there. And then the uh, females come in when the water is like 63 to 65, and they get together, the male having already made the nest and attracted a, a prospective mate to it. At that point, the spawn occurs, which takes two to three days, and uh, the hatch occurs three to seven days later, and the female leaves about oh, a couple of days after the eggs have actually been laid. So she's gone by now, and she's patrolling the area and uh, basically feeding and warding off predators, even though it's an inadvertent thing. The females hang around the area, and they actually help inadvertently in protecting the spawn by reducing predation in the area of the beds just by their predator presence. So, uh, and by the time it's 70 degrees, the spawn is pretty much done, and you just have males with large groups of fry, which can persist for up to a month, uh, and, and the water can get quite warm before that's done. The spawn is, is a time of year to, to, to look at and reflect, and, and it's appropriate that it's the beginning of our season because it's the beginning of the basses life too and that's the future of our fishing so i would really really ask people to respect the fish during this time of year and uh, i think we'll all have a better future for it summer is the time of peak metabolism for all the fish and you know the the lake is a big solar engine in other words the sun is the energy that feeds it and you can think of the lake as a as a single entity, and the bass is components in the lake, and the bait fish is components, but the, the lake drives the fastest and cranks the most in the heat of the summer. You know, 72 is, has long been published as the preferred temperature of bass, when actually it's up around 82 to 85. And uh, it, it's incredible that the myth could get started that way. And basically, it was because fi people were fishing deep reservoirs where the temperature got cold in the summer, and that was the lower limit that the bass would go to. They would only go to 68 to 70 degrees before they would in pursuit of food, and they'd stop there, so they concentrated there. But still, most of the fish in the summer were up in the warmer water. The metabolism is peaked, as we said. That means the demand for food is the greatest. And so the bass have to eat the most in order to maintain their weight in the summer. And indeed, summer is a time when fish go through the greatest growth spurt. So they eat a surplus at that time. And you'll see it in their activity. You'll see vast schools of bass chasing big schools of bait fish up on the surface in these feeding frenzies and that, which you don't see very much of in any of the cold months of the year. Matter of fact, you hardly ever see it. There were times of the month when the schooling activity peaked and the fish got really, really uh, wadded up in these big, massive wolf pack schools. And uh, that time of the month happened to be around the full moon. And uh, it, it seems that at that point, the bass really get grouped up. I think it probably has to do with the fact that other things in the, in the life cycle of the lake are also in some kind of a concentrated cycle, like the bluegill and spawn, you know, in, in May and, and June on the full moons and there's various insect hatches that occur on full moons and there's and the shad and all these things tend to group up and go through spawning migration so these fish capitalize on it and they really get into schools at that time of year and you'll see big schools cruising and moving and and looking for just something to pounce on it's a it's a very impressive sight underwater i think that the full moon in the summer months is a very very good moon to fish in and the, your moon the full moon has a great impact on the fish. It tends to concentrate things, so it's a boom or bust type thing. And uh, when people's expectations are high, they tend to be frustrated, and they can see that moon. It's a sign 
to them and the, the, uh, and it becomes a cause when it really isn't a cause, but it's something they notice and when fishing's bad as it is from time to time, when they see the full moon, they blame the full moon, they're looking for something to blame, but it's not the full moon. Spring and fall are transitional periods. You know, the two stable periods are summer and winter, and those are the transitions between the two. So the fish have to make adjustments for those periods, uh, those stable periods, in order to survive through the year. And then the fall has a lot of things happen in that transition that are different from, from the spring. Uh, there is a transition, but it's sort of mirrored. One's a mirror image of the other. and, and, and uh, I'll explain that by, say, the two basic types of water you find fish in, in the uh, spring and the fall. In the spring, you find fish inside. You find them in coves. You find them in things. In the fall, you find them on the outside. You find them on points, and, which is the opposite of coves, and you find them on the outside of structure. And in the spring, you find fish locked into these small places. In the fall, you find fish moving. They're constantly moving, so they can be very frustrating to catch. One thing that's really strange is that you hear all the time about this fall feeding peak that the fish feed up to prepare for winter, to store fat, because they don't get to eat much in the winter time. And that's true, but only in the northern climes. In the south, I've found that there is not a real feeding peak in the fall, so uh, the fishing in the south becomes more unpredictable and the fish become harder to catch in the fall. The only really obstacle you have in the north for catching good fish in the fall is the weather. And you know, the weather gets, the cold fronts start coming down, just gets really tough to catch fish under those conditions. But you're really dealing with the conditions more than the fish are. You know, so much of fishing is, is getting on the fish and getting on a pattern and then continuing it through a logical progression. But you have some dependability in terms of the fish staying in a certain place. Another one hint you could use in the fall is that, that most of the bait fish have had all spring and summer to grow up, so change to larger sizes of lures that cover more water and uh, depend on the fish being very aggressive if you find them so they will hit these larger lures and the larger lures are easier to see at a greater distance so they prospect better, they find fish faster. So I go to larger lures and I also favor the oranges and and crawfish colors and the brighter colors at that time of year because I want to be seen. They're moving out to the point you'll find them clear out two, three miles offshore on a long point. You'll find them in on humps that are close to the river channel and a reservoir or just submerged islands and that sort of thing. But places out from anywhere, you know, just they can be anywhere in the fall. Fish only have to eat probably every two, three weeks, maybe in some climates every month or so, if at all in the winter. Some fish hibernate in the winter, but the biggest bass ever caught in the north was caught through the ice in Massachusetts, and it was a 15 and a half pound largemouth. When you, and, and that fish was like by three times the state record in Massachusetts. So don't discount winter fishing. Winter fishing is a time to catch big fish, and the fish have stored fat, and they're heavy. They generally are different to fish for. You have to fish very slow. I can remember, and there's no reason it wouldn't work today when everybody switched from fishing, say, soft plastics to fishing pork. And you, you change to fishing a jig and a pork eel and uh, use very slow rolling spinner baits with big pork trailers on them in the winter. Pork is something to consider in the winter because the fish will we'll bite on it and, and taste it and chew on it and hold on to it. And, and often they'll come up to your lure and they'll nip it and they'll expect it to move and nip it again. You'll never feel them and they'll just swim off and leave it. So there's a lot in the winter that has to do with very slow methodical fishing and using lures that fish will tend to hold on to better. Colors are generally uh, not too critical. Um, use either black or white or a shad color. And another lure to look really strong at in the winter are jigging spoons and these little uh, blade baits, you know, the, uh, the, the kind that are just a, a gob of lead on a little stainless steel blade about that long, little minnow blades that fall. And those are very good. Vertical fishing is good in the winter because fish are on steep bluffs. You remember we talked about 
the fact that they have to be able to avoid the, the crush of a terrible cold front and then still be able to come up to feed so they will go to steep banks and they don't need a lot of flat territory to hunt on because they don't need that much food so they'll be next to the steepest bluffs and vertical fishing is a very good thing to do and also use lighter lines because the lines get very stiff and wiry and the wind's often blowing and it destroys your feel just blowing the heavy line so if you can drop the lighter lines you can use lighter weights and still fish effectively and catch more fish in the winter. Bass are sight feeders, and uh, fish don't have eyelids, therefore they have nothing to protect their eyes from the sun. Well, that's always been the context in which people argue for cloudy weather, but the eye actually is only kept wet by the eyelid, and if you look at, say, a frog, he has an eyelid and a tadpole, which is the same creature that metamorphosizes into a frog, doesn't have eyelids because he's in the water. So eyelids do not function in that manner. The bass has a lot of ways to control light. And when you get underwater, you'll see the difference in shade. Shade and, and bright light underwater are a lot different than shade and bright light, you know, topside. The, the shade is much deeper underwater. And on bright days, the uh, fish can actually use the light in ways uh, to camouflage themselves. Fish tend to be able to use cover and be deeper in cover in, uh, on bright days, but uh, there's also a lot that happens way out in open water that wouldn't happen on a cloudy day. You're gonna get better schooling activity because the beam light, the, the interplay of light on the fish actually helps camouflage the bass if you look at them and uh, they can swim up on prey in deep water and still be camouflaged by this light pattern. You know, the color, underwater colors uh, become very flat if, the, if it's cloudy, and when you have the advantage of sunlight, you can, you can play off a of flash. So I tend to use the metallic colored lures on sunny days and go to solid colors like uh, shad and pearl and that sort of thing on cloudy days. On bright days, you can use a variety of lures that you couldn't use. On uh, cloudy days, you tend to have to specialize more. The better they can see something, the more excited they get about it. The farther away they can see your lure, uh, the more varieties of bait fish they're going to feed on. Fish tend to be on edges, which is the predictable place for fish to be in cloudy weather, they don't tend to be as far back in cover and they also don't tend to be as active out in open water as they are on clear days. Fish are sensitive to different things under different conditions, so there's, there's ways that the fish are more skittish actually on cloudy days and on clear days, but for the most part, the way fishermen fish, I think that bass are less sensitive to the general approach that most fishermen take on cloudy days in terms of being skittish. It also, uh, makes certain things actually more visible. Uh, bright colors and things stand out because the water is, being flat, it's not nearly as dynamic. You know, there's so much interplay of light that's actually moving uh, when the sun is shining, just from the ripple effect of the waves. And when the light is flat, the fish tend to not be as deep in cover. They tend to use the edges more and uh, they tend to be where most fishermen would think they would be and where it's actually easier to catch them in a, in a lot of ways. And you know, natural isn't always best on a cloudy day. Really what you want fish to do is see your lure. If they don't see it, which is the number one sense that attracts a feeding bass, fire tiger, uh, bright yellows, chartreuses, the types of colors that you'd think would put fish off are really the kind of colors that attract them. You have to realize that a fish is actually an optimist. He comes to a lure because he wants to eat it, not because he wants to find a reason to reject it. So they're willing to ignore some of the unnatural bright colors if you just can get them to see the lure and approach it. And that's what the bright color does for you on a cloudy day. When you get a situation like wind, it can concentrate fish. And once you understand how that works, then it can be to your advantage.
one thing the wind does that's not really obvious, most people say, well, it blows all the bait fish to one side of the lake or the other. What it does is it blows the drift, the plankton, which is the food chain for the bait fish. And it tends to concentrate fish really tight in very shallow water. And in some of the roughest, most turbulent water on the windward side is where you can find some of the best concentrations of fish. And I look for bait fish in order to find these fish. It's when you can throw a spinner bait up on the edge and the bait fish just scatter out of the water. Uh, you'll see that a lot on windy days. So, you know, the wind on top water, I generally change to something that makes more commotion on a windy day. Um, I, I, go, I go with a popper, um, say, over a, a jerk bait. And, uh, but one of the things that's really, uh, I learned just in the last few years about the wind is, you know, casting. It's the ultimate frustration to cast in the <laughs> stuff. So most people turn around, put the wind at their back and cast and use the wind that way. And I found that my bite went up like, just from underwater observations, seeing that fish face into the wind, my bite went way up by throwing into the wind and uh, suffering the backlashes and retrieving downwind in the natural pattern that the bait fish uh, actually move in. So you get more bites if you'll cast into the wind. Wind is a current and it focuses the direction that things move and anytime that happens the predators are going to align with it. One suggestion I would have the guys that have a lot of trouble casting into the wind is your bite is almost as good if you'll cast crosswind. Just don't cast downwind and retrieve against the wind, because that's not the way bait moves. That's one of the things about rain, you know. Um, it's not so much what falls in the water, it's what falls up in the watersheds of our waterways and flows in that changes conditions. And uh, the changing conditions you most often can take advantage of are those that are obvious that you can see. One of my favorite things to look for is the change in color of water, as we've talked about. And uh, these creeks that come in and flow um, attract all kinds of things because it creates an edge of sorts, just like weeds or just like any other edge. And sometimes, uh, you know, that's when the change is most dramatic because then you have uh, dark water and perhaps even a sunny day afterwards. and mixing with clear water, so you've got all kinds of different things coming together. Uh, the rain tends to flatten uh, the impact of some of the creeks come in sometimes, but uh, you definitely they get really concentrated after the rain stops and the sun's out and you've still got this water coming in. And so many things change when it rains. You can't pinpoint any one of them, but the fact is it creates a very dynamic situation from one that was very kind of hot and stable and uh, this concentrates bait fish in different areas and it makes some wonderful fishing opportunities. Uh, when, when it rains, I move to the uh, outer edges of things, uh, realizing that water's coming in, water's flowing through the, uh, through the cover. I'll go to the outer edge and I'll also go right to the very inner edge, so that backwater behind the weeds, that's often the time that you can get back in there and catch fish in six inches of water or less, and a lot of big fish too. Weeds are one of the most relevant structures. I call them the most relevant. I break down structure importance to bass based on the value that it has, what it puts into the environment that the bass can use, and the weeds do the most. They not only provide structure, which just a rock would, but they also provide oxygen. They provide a food base for the bait fish and then a, a place for the bait fish to hide. And they clear the water. They, they, will, they will remove the nutrient that makes murky water that makes a, like a plankton bloom. And so the, they make it predation in some cases easier for the bass, especially when something's vulnerable on top. You know, they, they, the bass can see a long way, so that's when topwater lures become a, a very good choice. The weeds produce oxygen and the oxygen will peak in the highest brightest light times of the day and when the lights go out and the sun goes away they start to consume oxygen and the fishing will actually fall off as a matter of fact it can be measured with the pH actually falling with no vegetation and you have nothing producing oxygen and fish can shut down in the absence of oxygen and just lower their activity levels so that's 
that's the best thing for them to do. And they've got to cover the weeds to hunt from. So, you know, the top water is a great choice. You're really dealing with the absolute prime structure that, that the fish have, and you're dealing with a, a situation where the fish have the peak oxygen producing time of the weeds in which to feed, in which to peak their activity. So bass really deal with situations based on what's dealt to them. And uh, it's as simple as that. So they're not dictated to by situations or formulas. They are dictated to by the conditions. And when the oxygen peaks and, and activity within the lake peaks, that's the time their feeding activity is going to peak. They're an opportunist. Wood is the most relevant structure in a lot of lakes. You know, we can talk about preferred structures, but the preferred structure is the structure of abundance in a body of water. And there's so many lakes that have so many opportunities to fish wood that we can't be a, a versatile bass fisherman, even an adequate bass fisherman, if we don't understand how fish relate to wood and how fish relate to trees and the water and all the different aspects of wood. I mean, you can even um, throw docks in there, for, for that matter. What you have to realize about structures, when bass relate to structure, they want to be as close to it as they can get, because it gives them concealment. They want to meld with that form so that they're effectively hidden, so they become you know, misinterpreted by their prey as a part of that, and then they just break off and catch it. So if the structure is moving, they can't get as close to it. So it would be a lot less uh, preferred than something that was stable, where the fish could sidle right up against it. And, and you know, you may go underwater and see a fish two feet from a stump, but when he gets ready to feed, he'll come right close to it. Fishermen know that, you know. When they start pulling water and, and, and open dams and that, they start fishing right up close to cover. You know, that brings them close to structure. The other thing about trees is, you, you, we keep mentioning lying and leaning. The trees with the most lean to them are the ones that are most horizontal, cast the, the largest shadow. So a straight up type structure and trees are only good in low light when the sun relative to those trees is as if the tree was lying down. You, but, but when you want to catch fish midday, you have to fish trees that are lying horizontal to the sun when it's up. So uh, you can change your tactics early and late. A lot of people think, well, the fish just bite better in the morning. Well, they bite better in certain situations. And in certain situations in the middle of the day, they bite better. So you need to relate that to your fishing of trees, too, because uh, it's very important. I think the, the newer the trees are, the, of course, the more twigs and small things that are on them to, 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 to add to the cover. You know, the secret with cover is surface area. Uh, a, a, br a brush, a pile of brush has much more surface area on it than, say, a log, which might have more wood in it than a brush pile. But the brush will hold more fish because the surface area is what the microscopic growth collects on and, and it feeds all the bait. And the greenest stuff, the newest stuff, is the best because that's closer. You know, it hasn't been uh, degraded as much. It hasn't deteriorated as much. So, uh, you know, I've got pictures of, of just one little bush under a dock, say, that just loaded with big bass. And it's that dock is good because that bush is under it. And that bush is good because the dock is giving us that horizontal cover over the bush. So one little bush and one dock become extremely significant to hold a lot of big fish. A lot of the country, especially up north, uh, has an abundance of rock lakes due to all the glaciers sweeping the topsoil off and basically grinding out these lakes. So we have any degree of rocky lakes from the, the big lakes that are nothing but boulders all the way down to those that are basically mixed up with a lot of gravel, depending on how much work the glacier did. So we've got a lot of rock to talk about. Rocks are what I would put at the bottom of the list in terms of attractiveness to fish because they don't bring you remember we talked about waves bringing everything to the table, and the rocks don't bring everything. The rocks are basically a structure, and by their very structure, they can provide opportunities, little nooks and crannies for organic matter to collect and then start a food chain. But to have bass and to have fish, you have to have the elements of a food chain to start to, to feed the thing. So uh, 
the rocks provide that. And where the lake is predominantly rock, that's what you have to deal with. So you have to be able to choose the best kind of rocks. You know, one thing about riprap, we talked about the importance of current. Riprap is made, is put there by man to combat erosion. What does that tell you? There's current there. They put it around the dams where the water pull is the greatest. They put it where there's shoreline erosion on jetties and that where there's waves. So all that water action is what makes riprap key. So when you fish riprap, look for those areas of dynamic water and the times that the water is dynamic and uh, either rough weather that'll shake all the prey out of those nooks and crannies or when they're pulling water. The type of rock you want to look for is that which has the most surface area. That means broken up rock because the more the surface area, the more there are places to collect organic matter. And you want the nooks and crannies in those rocks, the little holes to be large enough to hold prey that would be bite-sized for bass. This leaves out fine gravel, for instance, and brings us into the preferred size being size of grapefruits to fists to, you know, that size of rock. That's what to look for if you look for nothing else. As long as it's large enough, we're talking big, big gravel, you know, and the fine gravel is good to spawn on, you see, because it doesn't have the nooks and crannies to lose the eggs in, so the bass like to get on something where they can't lose their eggs down in the crack. So they'll spawn on gravel, but they feed on larger rock. A lot of worm fishing is analyzing where your lure is by feel. And if you're just fishing and you're not getting any feedback from your plastic worm, you're probably not fishing in a good place. So you have to open up to all the things the worm's telling you. And often it's telling you, don't fish me here. Throw me someplace where you felt that little hint of brush and you just reel up and cast another place. You'd, you maybe move over just a little bit, try to get right in the middle of that brush pile. But when you feel something on that worm, that's the time to fish it. And the rest of the time, you're fishing for a place to fish it. The worm does not represent a worm or an eel or a snake or the things that we classically think of as a plastic worm. What a worm is, is a bait fish. It best represents a minnow. And in the water, you need to work your worm as if it is a minnow. Um, and, and a lot of the underwater things that I've observed, you'll see bait fish of various colors, all the browns, purples, everything that mm -hmm. you'd ever want to imagine in the grass. They're, they're hanging tight and still when they're spooked, they just dart off here or dart off there and then they settle back down and they try to hide. Their concealment is in that uh, action of just sitting still, unlike the silver bait fish that swim around in swarms. So we need to work a worm with that little hop and then by holding the rod up, allowing it to pendulum toward us and swim horizontally. And bigger is not always bigger fish. You know, I caught 12 bass in one summer over 10 pounds on a six inch worm. Uh, this, I get generally favor in open water, the smaller worms. And so my dictation of size has to do with how heavy the cover is. And uh, a small worm will attract a bite from a very large bass if it's put where the bass is. And if the bass happens to be in open water, you'll catch him there. So it's visibility that determines um, how large a worm you can have. If the cover is very heavy and the bass can't see very much, his view is obstructed, it takes a larger worm to get noticed. Often in heavy cover, if you fish a small lure, the bass has trouble finding it. Finesse involves enticing the bass. I would say that's the key word. Uh, by a gentler, softer, more natural approach. And it's generally associated with the tube jigs, gets its, and with very little weight and light lines to catch fish that have seen a lot of lures and that are that, that don't like a, a plastic worm with a lot of weight going bump and then sinking. You know, they like this slow drift and this float. So there's a lot of ways to finesse lures. The, the mini plastic worms that gets it's and uh, you know, even the Carolina rigs, you know, which you wouldn't think because you use a great big weight. That lure is on a long leader that allows the action of the weight to be separate from the lure and the lure floats almost weightless and the fish can take it and not feel the weight. So movement is the key to getting a bite, you know. This is why these little french fries that don't look like anything, when they move properly and they have that neutral buoyancy of a natural bait fish, in the water attract bites because they look natural. And there's really nothing unnatural about them. It's not that they look so supernatural. And uh, so movement is the key. 
It is a contact lure because anytime you get a mechanical lure that just repeats its action in open water, it becomes detectable as a bass just for what it is, as just a mechanical device coming through the water. When fish get educated, they will leave those alone. But if you can work it through cover, you will catch a lot more fish. And most of the good crankbaits today have a design that where the bill protrudes so low below the front of the lure that it rotates the hooks off of things and 90% of the times you hit something, they just come loose or they bounce off and that's when you get the strike. So that's the way to fish. The other thing about them is that they are a very good bottom fishing lure too. You know, you can, you can get that lure in shallow water where like a 10 foot, 12 foot deep running crankbait, throw it right up in shallow water and root and stay in contact with the bottom all the way down until you lose it. And that's another way that you can figure out how deep the edge is that you're fishing. You know, how long will that crankbait stay in contact with the bottom? So you can learn a lot about what you're fishing and read the water with your lure. And one of the things most people don't realize is that these lures run deepest when they're fished relatively slowly. Once you get them down to depth, you don't have to grind them anymore. And the people that bury the retrieve and, and you know, slow and then a couple of quick ones and make a rhythm within their retrieve will catch a lot more fish. And you do that off a slow roll, keeping that bait deep. Because when you get it running really fast and it gets under you, the drag of the line in the water tends to lift the lure. So you can't, so the faster you run it, the shallower it comes. So that's the way to keep it deep to the boat, reel it slower. I recommend that they try something that goes about 12 feet deep, something like a Pose 400 or a DB3, and uh, those type of lures are two good ones. Pradco makes a lot of good ones, but something that runs about 12 feet deep so you have the freedom with one lure to cover from shallow down to a pretty good depth. And when you learn to fish that one lure through all those strata and get a good feel for it, you'll be a better crankbait fisherman. The blade is the heart of a spinnerbait, even though as we've seen the bass eat the grub, the blade is what makes the grub do what it does, and uh, that's where the frontier for experimentation and development in spinnerbaits is going to be in the future, and we're seeing the, that right now. Color, solid colors are normally what you use in cloudy water, and uh, flash is what you normally go to in clear water, so when you incorporate flash along with color, all of a sudden we're giving a bass a whole new way to look at the spinnerbait, and uh, basically fish are caught on things that fish haven't seen yet. So uh, this is going to be an excitingly productive lure in the next years to come. I'm sure it will be. And with the wedge, when you pull it, this blade has so much weight to it that it that it tends to throw a much wider arc, and it has a lot of resistance in the water. So you're generating a tremendous amount of sonic vibration into the water with this lure reeled slowly, uh, much more so than you would say with a less effective blade reeled fast. And then the fish can see it, it's in the strike zone for a longer period of time. It's, it's a very exciting concept and uh, I know uh, too, you, you can see it when you pull this thing close to the surface too, it'll generate a wave that the fish can see and actually draw fish out of cover, you know, especially in clear water where, where they can see a good way. I'm, I'm really excited about this lure. And I've gotten to be, really like them. And really spinnerbaits is in using them. So the bite on a spinnerbait is always bigger fish. If you caught 10 fish on a, on a plastic worm and 10 fish on a spinnerbait, the average size of the spinnerbait fish would be at least twice.